the session again, winning the war against worldliness, the text verse, 1 John 2, 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I'd like for you to go with me in your mind's eye to the Mamertine prison. The aged apostle Paul is sitting in a prison cell awaiting death. As he takes his quill and dips it for the very last time in the inkwell of inspiration, two young men are on his mind. I'm going to read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearance. Do thy diligence to come unto me. As Paul is thinking about the end of his life, he's thinking about his fight. He's thinking about his finishing. He's thinking about his faith. But he's thinking about the future. Because he says in verse 9, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. He's writing, of course, to his son in the faith, Timothy. And I'm sure that as he writes this and the Holy Spirit moves him to write these words that his mind and heart begins to fill and flood with the memories of this young man, Timothy. If you've known someone in your ministry that you've seen saved and discipled and you've worked with and they've stood for the Lord and they're going strong for him, you know, there's no greater joy than to know that your children walk in truth. See, Timothy was the future. He was the man that Paul was leaving behind. And as wonderful as it must have been for Paul to think about Timothy from his jail cell, it must have been equally as terrible when the Holy Spirit leads him to write about another man. Look at verse 9 if you're there. Or verse 10, excuse me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. As Paul's writing to Timothy, He's not thinking so much about the future. Timothy was his future. Now he's thinking about his failure. The Bible says that Demas forsook Paul because he loved this present world. And to take a look at Demas, you would not have thought that this young man was worldly at all. See, Demas had probably left everything behind to travel the missionary trail with Paul. He could probably win preaching contests. He probably knew how to tie his tie correctly, probably had the right haircut. He could do everything in the ministry that Paul needed him to do. Think about this. He was the right-hand man of the man. That was Demas. If there was ever a young man that you would look at and say, this young man is not worldly, it would have been Demas. The Bible says, Paul says, Demas has forsaken me because he fell in love with this present world. He left me. How did the best kid in the youth group just up and leave? Let's call his name Justin. I had only been at our church for a year. I've been the youth pastor at Worth Baptist Church for six years now. Worked with teenagers for over ten years. I had been at Worth for one year, and uh, Justin and his family visited our church. They were a military family, so they had moved around quite often. As I got to know him a little bit, he had been in the greatest youth groups in America. Now, we were starving in our youth department for male leadership at the time. i have been praying that God would send us a young man that could kind of be the standard bearer for the group. Every ministry needs leaders, and I was praying that God would send us a strong male leader for our youth department. As Justin came up the first day, I want you to know I killed the fatted calf for that kid. God is no respecter of persons, but sometimes youth pastors are. I wanted him to join our church. He spoke in a very respectful way. He looked you in the eye when he shook your hand. He was dressed perfectly. I mean, this was the kind of kid I thought could be the standard bearer for our youth group. I was so excited. I was even more excited when they joined our church. Here was a young man that didn't know all the answers. He had been in all the greatest youth groups in America. I was pumped to have him. Not long after Justin got there, I discovered that he had a love for basketball. So I did something one time, and I've never done it since then. I had a promotion in our youth department that tied the secular, a pair of Dallas Mavericks basketball tickets, and they used to be really good at this time, Dallas Mavericks basketball tickets to some spiritual things that I wanted the young people to do. 
Now, Justin had not been coming to visitation, so I wanted him to come. And we have a large youth department, but I really wanted him there. So I made visitation a part of the promotion. I said, if you'll come to visitation, you can get points, win the tickets. Justin wanted the tickets, so he started coming to visitation. Uh, the first day, I kind of figured something was a little wrong with Justin. We were knocking doors together. We would knock on doors, and he had been trained impeccably. You could tell. He knocked on the doors, but he sounded just like this. Hi, my name's Justin from Worth Baptist Church. We're just out in the neighborhood. We'd like to invite you to come. Do you want to come to church? Well, there happened to be a lady there who said, yes, I'd like to come. When is it? So he explained it in that very monotone, passionless voice. Then before he left, I could tell someone had taught him the right thing because before he left the door, he said, ma'am, I have one more question for you. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? And she thought about it, and she said, no, I'm not. And in the most monotone, passionless way I've ever heard anyone give the gospel, it grieved me to hear him give the gospel. He led her through the Romans road, and guess what happened? She got saved. The gospel's powerful. You know, uh, she closed the door, and uh, I said to Justin, Justin, the angels in heaven are rejoicing. A sinner just got saved. Isn't that wonderful? He said, yeah, I guess so. He kept on coming for the next few months while we were having the promotion. He won the basketball tickets. We went great seats, and guess what? Justin never came back to visitation after that. Again, the basketball tickets were over, and so was visitation. He graduated from our youth group, still with the same looking people in the eye, still with the same yes, sir, no, ma'am, still dressing in a suit. But listen, one year later, he was an alcoholic, addicted to drugs, and would not step foot in our church again. If there was ever a young man, I thought this could be the leader. I mean, he's got it all down. It looks so right. It was Justin. But he departed, having loved this present world. I'm sure you've heard the survey. 80% of young people that graduate from youth departments in America do not go to church after they graduate. And I want you to know that when they walk across the stage and they receive their diploma, it's not like some magic switch flitch, uh, some, some magic switch flicks. It's not like just magically, now that they're high school graduates, they decide they don't want to come back to church anymore. Listen to me. It didn't start when they got to college. It started while they were sitting in the Sunday school class, singing the songs, hearing the messages. Their bodies were there, but their hearts were a long way away. Before anyone ever deserts the Lord, they drift. And I don't know if Paul saw it because we don't record it, but before Demas ever left, before young people ever leave, before Justin ever left, they drift. So what's the answer to all this? How can we tell if one of our young people are really struggling with worldliness or not? And what is it? This isn't a new tactic of Satan and it's not a new problem. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon wrote 150 years ago. I believe that one reason why the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. Put your finger on any prosperous page in the church's history and I will find a little marginal note reading thus. In this age, men could readily see where the church began and where the world ended. Never were there good times when the church and the world were joined in marriage with one another. The more the church is distinct from the world in her acts and in maxims, the more true is her testimony for Christ and the more potent is her witness against sin. And I want you to know if you plan to work with young people or any people, every day we are fighting a war in the hearts of our people. We are fighting against a love for this world. We are fighting for a love of the Father. There are two questions I want to answer very quickly in this session. The first one is, just so we make sure we get on the same page, what is worldliness? Second question we're going to ask, kind of the subject of this session, how can I win the war against worldliness? Let's look at first, what is worldliness? It's right from our text, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Notice the call. He says, love not the world. Now, this is one of God's divine imperatives. This is not a good idea or a suggestion. It is a command. It's not your mom walking into the room and saying, it sure would be a good idea, honey, if you made your bed today. This is your dad walking in the room and saying, get up and make your bed right now. 
It's a command. He says, love not the world. What in the world is the world? Well, when he talks about the word world here, he's not talking about creation. Because the Bible says that when God looked down on creation, it was good. He's not also talking about people because the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. See, God wouldn't tell us not to love something that he loves. He wants us to love lost sinners. What's he talking about? The word world here is the word cosmos. It refers to the organized system of human civilization that is actively hostile to God and alienated from God. Let me say it this way. It is the world system without God. Humanity that is godless and in opposition to God. It is humanity which rightly deserves the wrath of God because I love God. I'm not supposed to love what's godless about this world. That's the call, love not the world. Next, the clarification. He says, neither the things that are in the world. The first command is a command not to let the godless people of this world steal my love for God. The clarification is a command not to let the lifeless possessions of this world steal my love for God. I am not to let the things of this world make me worldly. I'm not to get so bound up in the world of sports that I forget which world to which I really belong. I'm not to get so bound up in the world of fashion that I forget to which world I truly belong. The things in this world, many of them are fine, but there is a problem when we begin to love the things of this world more than we love the one who gave those things. Almost anything that God has given us can be perverted and twisted to where we love the creation more than we love the creator. And that's worldliness, okay? So he gives us the command, the clarification. I read this in a book on worldliness, and I think it's so good. I want you to imagine this scenario, if you will. It will reveal if you are in love with the things of this world, if you're in love with God. Imagine that I said to you, you could have your perfect day. Anything you wanted to do, anywhere you wanted to go, anybody you wanted to be with, that's your perfect day. You can do anything, have anything, be with anyone that you want. Think about it for a second. What did you pick? If in that perfect day you didn't make room for Jesus, you're in love for the world. Love with the world. All right, so the command, love not the world. The clarification, neither the things that are in the world. And then here's the conclusion, and this is key. Don't miss it. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, what's the key theme of this verse? The key theme of this session is worldliness. What's the key theme of this verse? Well, there are two words that are repeated three times each. Curse, of course, the word world, but there's another word. It's given first, and it's given last, and it's what this verse is actually all about, and that's the word love. Why does God give us this warning? Because worldliness is not a matter of standard or rules. Worldliness is a matter of love. God takes worldliness so serious because just like Demas, it threatens to steal from God what he wants from us, and that is our love. Worldliness, then, is a love for this fallen world. It's loving the values and pursuits of this world that stand opposed to God. It dethrones God and enthrones self. Worldliness is a, di a desire to seek what pleases me and what I love instead of what pleases God and what he loves. Where does worldliness begin? If it is a matter of love, then where does it start? In the heart. It does not start with baggy pants, body piercings, or tattoos, though that may be the fruit. Where does it start? It starts in my heart with what I love. And young people and all the folks that are in here, that's why we have to fight it. Because our God is jealous that his people love him. And those of us that love him ought to be jealous that his people love him too. All right, so number one, what is worldliness? Number two, how can I win the war against worldliness? So what is worldliness? It's a love for this fallen world. How can I win the war? I think the first rule you have to do when talking about ministry is, number one, start with yourself. Start with yourself. 
Realize that the subtle seduction of worldliness is something that fights against us all. I cannot help people win the battle of worldliness in their lives if I'm losing it in my own lives. If your young people think that you love the world of sports more than you love God, they know you're worldly. I go to youth groups all across America. I've seen youth group after youth group built around sports, and they talk more about sports than they do Jesus. That's a worldly youth group. I don't care what standards they have. Listen to me today. Here it is. You've got to start with yourself. I've seen other youth groups that are just built flatly and plainly on the carnality of the youth leader. I got to Worth Baptist Church the first Sunday, and Dr. Barber happened to be there. He's our pastor emeritus, and I thank God for his influence and the influence of my pastor, Dr. Willie Weaver, on me. I got there the first day, and I asked Dr. Barber, Dr. Barber, I want to do the best job I can here for the Lord. What's the key to youth ministry? And I was expecting him to give me one of his lists. You know how he does. You need to be pure and powerful and preserved. And I was expecting that. He looked at me and told me something very simple. He looked me in the eyes. He said, you and your wife be a good example. And I've taken that to heart. If there's nothing else I can be for these young people, I can be an example of someone who loves God more than he loves this world. You know what youth ministry is, folks, and especially students when you get out of here? It is showing young people what a life is like when it is fully surrendered and fully in love with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. All right, so I have to first start with myself. Secondly, and this is not going to sound practical, but it is the most practical thing you can do to help someone love the Father. Number two, lift up the Lord Jesus. Lift up the Lord Jesus. I want you to go with me in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Song of Solomon. When we come to Song of Solomon, we come to a young lady who is in exactly the same position that many of our young people are in. Here is a young lady, I personally believe, and you may disagree, that there are three main characters in the book of Song of Solomon. I believe the first main character is the Shulamite. She is a picture of the church, or we could even say this, a picture of the individual believer. The second character is King Solomon. And to me, in this book, he is a picture of the world. Everything that is seductive and everything that seems pleasant to a person about the world, King Solomon embodies that in this book. Then you have another character, and he's the shepherd. And guess who that pictures? That pictures our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, some of you disagree, but here's how I think the book Song of Solomon goes. The young lady, the Shunammite, is engaged to the shepherd. Solomon comes along and sees how pretty she is, and he steals her away and takes her to the palace of Jerusalem. And the rest of this book is a contest between Solomon and between the shepherd for the Shunammite's affection. Now I want you to look with me, Song of Solomon, chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 9 here in just a moment, but here's what's happened earlier in the passage. You've probably heard a message on it before. The shepherd steals behind enemy lines, perhaps gets by some guards who would be guarding this beautiful woman's room, and he comes and knocks on the door. You remember the story? She won't get up. She's already put her lotion on. She's already dressed for bed. She decides she's not going to get up and go to the door. She said, I'm sorry. Come back later. He's gone to great trouble to spend some time with her. And she says, listen, I just can't do it tonight. Then something interesting happens. The Bible says that the shepherd puts his hand by the hole of the door. Now, let's take a time out here just for a second because this is too good for me to pass up, okay? If the shepherd is Jesus... What do we see when he puts his hand by the hole of the door? We see nail scars, friend. Something about what she saw from his hand so motivated her and moved her that she got up and went looking for him, but found that he, found that he was gone. So she goes out in the city, and she's looking for him. Song of Solomon chapter 5, verse 9, she's talking to these daughters of Jerusalem. She says, listen, if you find my love, tell me where he is. And they ask her a question that young people all across America are asking of us. Look at verse 9. What is thy beloved more than another beloved, O thou fairest among women? What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? In other words, here's what they're saying. You have the affection of Solomon. All his power, all his prosperity, all his pleasure at your disposal. What's so special about this shepherd from the country? 
Well, she begins in this passage, and I'm not going to get a chance to read it all, to give one of the most beautiful descriptions of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ that you will ever read in the entire scripture. I'm telling you, there's gold in these hills. Her summation is given in verse 16. His mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now look at chapter 6, verse 1. Whither is thy beloved gone, O thou fearest among women? Whither is thy beloved turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? In other words, she was so convinced that what she had was so much better than what these ladies could get from the world that by the time she gets done talking about how much she loves Jesus, they say, where is he? We want to find him too. There's a world full of young people that are asking, what's so special about Jesus Christ? What can Jesus give me that this world can't give me? And we need people that are so consumed with the person of Jesus Christ that can tell him exactly what he is, reveal him in his splendor and his glory, so that when we get done telling people how much we love Jesus, they'll say, where is he? I want to find him too. <laughs> you know, she, she, she can't exaggerate about the Savior. She can't say too many good things about her shepherd. And if these daughters of Jerusalem ever met the shepherd, I promise they would not be disappointed in her description. When they ask her, what's so special about your beloved? Listen to me. She doesn't start talking about what's wrong with Solomon. Instead, she decides to talk about what's so good about her shepherd. See, young people, you can talk about how terrible this world is. And I want you to know we need to preach the Bible just like it is. We need to preach against sin strongly. But young people in particular don't think ahead. They don't think about the consequences of their sin, not many of them. We need to not act like when they're sitting at the devil's table and the devil passes them something that looks so good to eat. We need to stop telling hungry people don't eat that. You know what we need to start telling them? Here's something better. You know why? Because hungry people are going to eat. And we need to offer them something better. That's why I say we need to lift up the Lord Jesus because if we can lift him up, they will see how wonderful he is. She made her beloved so lovely that those in love with the world wanted to leave the world to spend some time with him. Imagine that. When our young people get into the youth department, many of them can be compared to a hard piece of steel. This is the best comparison that I have. They need to be molded and changed into something useful for the Savior, but they're rough. and They're hard to bend. A lot of people have the philosophy that if I can put so much outward pressure on this young person, I can get them to bend and conform to what I want them to be. And I want you to know something. You push hard enough, and you push long enough, and they'll bend. But guess what happens when you take the hands off, when you take your hands off? It goes right back. Or you just keep pressing and keep pushing, and guess what eventually happens? They snap. You know the only way to mold metal? To heat it from within. You know what a love for God is? It is a heating from within that allows the Holy Spirit of God to mold and make that young person what God wants them to be. William Borden of Yale said, in every heart there is a throne and a cross. Either Christ is on the throne and self is on the cross, or self is on the cross and Christ is on the throne. Remember, the greatest problem with worldliness is not baggy pants, tattoos, or body piercing. That's the fruit. We'll get to that here in a minute. The greatest problem with worldliness is a matter of the heart. When a young person truly begins to love the Father, they will love this world less and less. Thomas Chalmers, the great Puritan, called it the expulsive power of a new affection. He said that an affection for the Lord was stronger and deeper and truer than any love anyone could have for anything else. And that if you could put the love of a father in a person, if you could put God's love in that person, that it would rule over the love for the world. You know, when self is on the throne, self is a tyrant and a usurper. 
He has no right to rule the heart. The heart was made for God. When King Jesus comes and sits on the throne of the heart, we recognize that he is the true ruler. My heart has found its rightful king, and a love for something weak and temporary will be replaced by a love for something strong and eternal. That's what John is saying in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Love the Father, and you won't love the world. What this world has to offer is attractive and seductive to our young people, and we don't need to act like it's not. We need to say to our young people, why would anyone settle for Solomon when they could have the shepherd? Preach him, unveil him, reveal him, live him in your life. Put his nail-scarred hand to the door of their hearts and watch them get up leave their beds of ease, and give their life to serve him. What do we need to do? We need to start in our own lives. Secondly, we need to lift up the Lord Jesus. Thirdly, we need to inspect the fruit, but deal with the root. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 3, if you will. We need to inspect the fruit, but deal with the root. When we come to Matthew's gospel in chapter 3, We're coming to the ministry of John the Baptist. We're going to read some pretty incredible things here. Look with me at verse 8, or verse 7, excuse me. But when he saw many, he being John the Baptist, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come, bring forth therefore fruits, and I want you to circle that word in your Bible, fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to of, the, of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the, circle this word, root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. There are two words that tell us about the ministry of John the Baptist, fruit and root. Baggy pants, body piercings, and tattoos are fruit problems. Loving the world is a root problem. It is a problem that starts in the heart and goes all the way to the heart. Of course, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Every issue of life goes back to the heart. In this passage, John the Baptist sees the fruit, but you know what he's doing in verse 10? He is taking an axe, and laying it to the root of the tree. For those of you that are God-called preachers, I can't think of a better description of what preaching is than taking an ax and laying it to the root of the tree. Now, we need to inspect the fruit. The fruit is important. He told those Pharisees and Sadducees, you say you're interested in this, you bring forth some fruits that are meat for repentance. John understood that the wrong fruit was really an issue with the wrong root. There are two fruits of worldliness that you'll notice in your young people. The first is the fruit of unrighteousness. And that is the easiest fruit to recognize because we are accustomed to look for it. These are the things that we commonly equate with worldly behavior. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about these fruits because we know exactly what they are. We know when somebody is struggling with unrighteousness in their lives, it's easy to see. Now, I will say this. Let's not excuse unrighteousness in our lives or in the lives of our young people. Every fruit is a manifestation of its root. If you have young people that struggle with unrighteousness, and we all do, it is because deep within their heart they do not have the love for the Father that they need to have. Their love for the world is increasing. Their love for the Father is decreasing. Deal with unrighteousness. Confront it lovingly in the lives of your teens and take it back to the heart issues. All right. So the first fruit is unrighteousness. The second fruit is one that we are not as accustomed to seeing, and that is self-righteousness. And this is actually the group of people that John was talking to in this passage. He was talking to Pharisees and Sadducees, who by outward appearance were righteous, but inwardly their righteousness was what? A self-righteousness. That's the root that John is laying an ax to in this passage. We are so accustomed to looking for the fruit of unrighteousness that we either ignore or can't see the fruits of self-righteousness. These are the young people that know the clothes to wear, know the words to say, and are experts at fooling the youth pastor. And you will have some, I promise you. 
over the past 10 years of working with young people, I've come up with what I call a few fruit inspections. These are things that I look for to see if I have a self-righteous, worldly, loving young person in my youth department. The first inspection I always like to take is the singing inspection. You want to gauge the spirituality of a teenager, watch him when it's time to sing. People that love Jesus have a song in their heart. It just overflows. They love to sing. I mean, they put the amazing in amazing grace. People that don't have a heart that's full of love for the Father don't sing. So what Ephesians 5.18 says, you're familiar with it. Be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. What's the first sign of the Spirit's filling? Verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Watch the young people. If week after week they look as excited as a wet roll of toilet paper when it's time to sing, you've got a problem in the heart of that young person. They don't love the Lord. And I can promise you this, every young person is singing about something. So you need to find out what they're singing about, what they're excited about. All right, so first, the singing inspection. Secondly, what I like to call the serving inspection. See, when a person truly loves the Lord as God with all his heart, all his soul, and with all his mind, he begins to love his neighbor as his self. And most of the time, you can tell whether the heart of a young person is red hot for God if they enjoy serving. Now, this also can be an act of self-righteousness. Uh, like I said, I had a young man come to visitation every Saturday for two months, and he ended up a drug addict and alcoholic a year later. Serving can be tricky to deal with. But here's what I've found to be the best gauge of whether someone's service is really spiritual or not. Give them something to do that only God will know about. And if they enjoy it and take it on with joy, that tells you from their heart they want to serve the Lord. If they're the kind of young person that always wants to sing the solo, always wants to have the special upfront job, and never wants to do the behind-the-scenes work, that tells you they have a heart problem. I've got this eighth grader in my youth department right now. He's a real goofy kid. And I ask him all the time to do little things for me. I'm all the time asking teens, straighten chairs, put this book up, all the time trying to get to their heart. And every time I ask this kid to do something, he goes, oh, like that. You, listen, what's the problem? It's not just a laziness or a slothfulness problem. That's part of it. He's got a heart problem, okay? All right, so the first test is the singing inspection. The second test is the serving inspection. Here's one that I find to be a very clear revealer, and that is the spiritual inspection. Do you want to know what's going on in someone's spirit? Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6, if you will. When Paul was writing to the church of Galatia, he was writing to a group of people that struggled with the sin of self-righteousness. Their fruits were not unrighteousness, they were self-righteousness. And Paul goes through this long doctrinal treatise about uh, the works of the flesh versus the works of the spirit in Galatians chapter 5. And now he gets to Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. And this is the overflow of the spirit-filled fruitful life. Look with me at verse 1. Brethren... If a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. True spirituality seeks to restore those that struggle with unrighteousness. In fact, it goes on to say that when I am not willing to restore others, I am opening myself up to unrighteousness. You know why? Because self-righteousness always leads to unrighteousness. So if you have a young person that is too good to sit with other young people in your youth department, too good to mix with the, with the kids in the back, I don't care how many visitations they come to, how many teen choir practices they make, they are not spiritual because a spiritual man seeks to help other people take spiritual steps and bring people on restoration to God. If they separate themselves from other young people in the youth department, trying to help them grow spiritually, that's a problem. See, Jesus was not a friend to sin, but he was a friend to sinners. And people that truly love the Lord have a heart for sinners. They really do. All right, so you have the singing inspection, the serving inspection, and the spiritual inspection. So you say, Tyler, what is the answer? I see this fruit of unrighteousness, or I see this fruit of self-righteousness. What is the answer to this fruit? Let me just say this very quickly. The gospel, the Lord Jesus. 
is the answer to the unrighteousness of man and the answer to the self-righteousness of man. If you will lift him up, he will draw men to himself. The Holy Spirit of God will shed his love abroad in their heart. They will start to love the Father. They will stop loving the world, and they'll serve the Lord with their lives. Can I tell you this? Realize that in your own life and in the life of your ministry, you can win the war against worldliness. You can. You know why? Because the love of the Father truly is stronger than the love of this world. You can win the war, but listen to me. I'm going to help you now. There will be casualties. If Paul lost some, you will too. And your heart will break for those young people. Thank God for those Timothys that stay true. We must fight the war against worldliness because we must fight for the hearts of our young people. Their sin nature loves to love this world. We have, stronger with, we have something stronger with which to fight. We have the good news of the love of the Father. Let's win the war against worldliness in our own lives and in our ministries. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this powerful verse. It's a verse that for far too long in my life I did not understand. Thank you, Lord, that you want to sit on the throne of my heart and be its rightful king. Lord, I pray that our love for you will truly expel lesser affections and our love for this world. We love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.